What's up, everybody? It's Josh. We need to talk about the mother flipping X Men because there is a new report out there talking about what comic book run Feige is going to model the MCU version of the X Men after. And so I want to talk about the report, whether or not I believe the report, which, spoiler alert, I do. And then I want to talk about this run from the X Men because, as a big comic book fan, this was a crazy time in the X Men's history. And there's a lot of juicy stuff to get into and speculate on how Feige will use these different elements in the MCU. So this is an article over on ScreenGeek.net, and it is an exclusive for them plot details for the X-Men MCU movie revealed. Now, again, this is just a report, so take it with a grain of salt, treat it as a rumor for now, but Screen Geek has recently got several things right and before anybody else, so they obviously do have some sources. So let's just jump into the juicy stuff here, although I do believe the entire article is well put together and worth a read. They go into Joss Whedon's controversy. They go into rumors about the X-Men not being able to actually be brought into the MCU till 2025. So check out the full article. But here's the juicy details for us. It says here, our sources have told us that Marvel Studios' current plan is for the X or for the MCU X-Men film to be based on Joss Whedon's Astonishing X-Men run. Astonishing X-Men was a comic book series, the continuation of Grant Morrison's new X-Men. Whedon's run began in 2004 and ended in 2008. It's unclear which X-Men team the studio plans on using, but it's worth noting that the lineup in that series was Cyclops and Emma Frost, who were the co-team leaders, and also included Beast, Kitty Pride, Wolverine, and Colossus. And look, the Colossus thing is kind of a spoiler, I guess, depending on how you look at it, because it's a really old comic book run at this point. But we're going to get into all of that, because it's not just that he used these characters, but these characters were on a really interesting impasse following up Grant Morrison's new X-Men, which I absolutely love. Holy shit, I love the X-Men. Now, it's also said in this article here that that group was also featured in various limited series, including World War Hulk X-Men. Whedon's Astonishing X-Men run featured four different story arcs in Gifted, Dangerous, Torn, and Unstoppable. A summarized version of the overall plot is that the team must stop an alien race from destroying Earth while also dealing with the announcement of a mutant cure and various other problems that come about along the way. So before we get into the comic book juiciness and, and how Feige might use them, let's linger on this for a little bit. You know, I've seen a lot of people saying, there's no way this is true. They don't even have a script yet. Why would they already know what they're going to do for the X-Men film? Yada, yada, yada. And I will just tell you that I highly believe or strongly believe or whatever word makes sense in that sentence, believe that Kevin Feige has been thinking about what he would do with the X-Men in the MCU for years. I mean, first of all, the guy's a big, sweaty comic book nerd, but beyond even that, if you look back to post credit scenes from the first MCU movie, Iron Man, Feige already wanted to put the mutants in there. He's been thinking about this for a long, long time. I think this is, in fact, part of his secret sauce. Why he is so good at what he is doing is because he's technically been producing his version of Marvel movies for like 30, 40 years, just in his head with action figures, probably even when he was doing the Fox stuff, right? He was thinking of how he would do it if he had full control. And so I definitely think that Kevin Feige has been carefully thinking about what X-Men run to adapt for the MCU version. Now, let's talk about the Joss Whedon of all of this because... There is somewhat of a stink around the name Joss Whedon, at least in the last couple of years. Of course, some of this comes from the Snyder Cut and him taking over and doing the Justice League Cut, which was a total massacre of Zack's film You know that came out, I think, in 2017 at this point. But a lot of Snyder fans have absolutely not forgiven him for that. And around that time, there were even allegations made against him by like Gal Gadot and others that basically just Joss Whedon was really horrible on that set and treated a lot of people like crap. However, you know, depending on how you feel about that, I think you also can't deny that he's really good at what he does. I mean, this comic book run was absolutely incredible. And of course, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, very legendary television show. And I think the first Avengers movie and even the second Avengers movie are really good adaptations of comics. And to me, really solidified the MCU on the path that it is currently on. Like Joss Whedon, for all of the bad things that he has done creatively, he has done some really brilliant things, including this run 
of the X-Men. And I don't know, maybe I don't talk about this enough, but I'm actually a massive Grant Morrison fan. And the Grant Morrison run of New X-Men was so crazy. Like so many wild different things are happening. You got the Zorn Magneto thing. You've got a drug that's making mutants more powerful. It all leads to this weird thing where the genes themselves that are mutating are actually sentient and in charge of all of the mutants and trying to create the perfect mutant, which is like a, a combination of Nightcrawler and Dark Beast and all of these different things. Like, it got hella weird. And it was also made in a response to the Fox X-Men films, right? So the Fox X-Men movies come out and they do the leather costumes and they sort of modernize everything. And so Morrison takes that stuff and brings it to comic books. Like the freaking new X-Men had a bunch of leather suits. He, he really tried to model it after what was going on in the films. And it was a really cool time in comics. And in the sort of sequel or follow-up run to that, Joss Whedon and Cassidy basically just took those ideas and ran with it. And they, they changed some things, like they put them back in spandex. And it's actually funny how that is approached within the book. Because Cyclops is like, you know, if we want to be a hero team, we got to look like heroes. And plus, everybody was starting to get weirded out by all that leather. Like, it's fun little things like that. And you get some of the best Joss Whedon stuff from, you know, what you remember from, like, uh, Buffy in this book. And, you know, talking about the characters, because this is the thing, right? Will we see this group as the X-Men in the MCU? It's very likely if he's adapting you know, from this run, you will see them. And I think the core character here, like the one we need to talk about the most, is actually Kitty Pride. Kitty Pride is so central to making this run work and to pulling off the ending that this run had. And she it's it's just like with Buffy. Like this sort of central character that's, you know, just kind of a little wide eyed and and always, you know, we're rooting for and, and she's sort of struggling with all these, these different things as the, the world's caving in on her and all these massive obstacles are facing her and the world she lives in. That was kind of like some of the juice from Buffy and we didn't like took all that juice and put it on Kitty Pride. And I think this run really solidified Kitty Pride as a fan favorite X-Men character for many, many people. And I think having Kitty, having Lockheed, her little dragon pet, and having her relationship with Colossus in this X-Men movie or whatever this ends up being, right, would be a very, very smart move. I feel like that's a good central anchor for the film, and it was for the comic book run as well. Now, let's talk about Cyclops and let's talk about Emma Frost, okay? Brilliant to have these two leading the team. And Cyclops was at such a weird place because at the end of Grant Morrison's X-Men, Magneto literally kills Jean Grey, okay? And then freaking Wolverine cuts off Magneto's head. It was really crazy, okay? But essentially, you have a situation where even before that, Cyclops was having like a psychic affair with Emma Frost. And so he feels all this guilt, but he's still like with Emma because he does have feelings for Emma, but he's grieving and remorse over what happened to Jean. So he's kind of like split up into a weird spot here as a person, but it's also interesting because this is the sort of beginning of the cool guy Scott Summers arc. Like, this is when Cyclops really became an, an absolute, like, awesome leader. Like, he was stoic. He had good speeches. He did some really funny lines and stuff like that. So this was, like, cool guy Cyclops and his sort of beginning in comics. And so I think that would be such a cool way to do this film. I'm going to talk more about just like the overall plot of it in a second here, but I just, I think this is a really strong choice to have Scotty Summers from this particular time in comics to be the one that we're first introduced to in the MCU. Now, Emma Frost is his lover, his co-captain, and, you know, possibly also like a Grima worm tongue in a little bit. You know, she's like whispering sweet nothings into his ear, really influencing Scott. And there's always an air of mystery and villainy when it comes to Emma Frost. Before this, Emma Frost was a villain. She did some really messed up stuff. And Kitty in particular has super big beef uh, with Emma during this whole comic book run. It's interesting that she's a part of the team, she's leading the team, she's helping out, but there's also this like nefarious thing going on, which ends up paying off later in the series. And yeah, spoiler alert, she was a double agent and, you know, that ends up being bad. But again, to introduce the X-Men, you know, again in Marvel, I think this version of Emma, considering that we have actually experienced Emma before 
in the Fox X-Men stuff is cool. This is a really cool choice to take this character from this run and present her for this movie. So let's talk about Beast for a second. This is such a fun time for Beast as well, because during Grant Morrison's run, there's a secondary mutation thing that's explored with Beast, and he actually changes his physical features. So he looks less like, like an ape and ends up looking more like a cat. He has, a, he has like a cat face in uh, the Grant Morrison run, and I love cat face Beast. Like just as a fan, like people have their preferences or whatever, it's fine for me. Cat face Beast is where it's at. I loved the look. And there's this element to Beast during this run where he's like almost like the Hulk, like losing control and becoming like feral Beast. And, you know, later that's revealed to be kind of like what was going on with Emma and the person she's actually working for and stuff like that. But a really, really cool way to put Beast into the MCU, differentiate him from what we saw before, give him the cat face, make him sort of hulking out. And uh, yeah, so I love Beast. I think this would be dope if they do this in the MCU. Let's talk about Colossus briefly because there's not too much juice here. Essentially, the real juice with Colossus is that he's dead and they find him in the run. This comes from an older comic book where there was a virus that was killing all of the mutants and a cure is created, I believe by Beast, actually. Uh, but somebody needs to sacrifice themselves so that the cure can like go out there to all the mutants. So Colossus sacrifices himself to save all of mutant kind. You know, him and Kitty have a relationship at that point. She's heartbroken, of course. He has a heroic death. They find him again. He didn't actually die. He's like down in this crazy base and they end up finding him, bringing him back in. You know, the relationship between he uh, and Kitty Pride uh, is consummated and they continue to just kind of have their thing throughout the series uh, after that point, which again is really cool, adds to the flavor of the X-Men. You know, if you've never read X-Men, maybe you're kind of picking up on this as I'm explaining this stuff, but part of the juice with X-Men is the relationships, right? Like, it's cool they have the powers, it's cool they go save the world, and the conflict is important, but it's really the characters and the relationships that they have that created the real juice for the X-Men. So that's why I'm, like, talking about these different things with the characters, because I'm excited to see that stuff explored in live action. Okay, now let's talk about Wolverine. Now, Wolverine is freaking Wolverine at this point and I think his role in this series was not like it was not all that impressive there are a couple really cool moments like when Cyclops or when uh, Colossus comes back to life and they do the fastball special again like that shit was really crazy he ends up coming into Scott Summer's room with him and Emma naked in bed together and he's like what stage of grieving is this and Cyclops like blasts him with the beam and shit so like he has some really cool moments throughout the run but I don't think he does anything of particular note for the story. He's just Wolverine being Wolverine, and he's used really well in this run. I think this would be a brilliant team for whoever the new Wolverine is to be to hang out with uh, and to explore. So now let me talk about the story. And I know it's a long video, but it's X-Men. It's friggin' awesome. So just buckle up, man, because we got a lot more to talk about. The story is wild, and it gets super probably too wild at the end of it. But the basic gist of it is that there is this alien and this alien race. They have this prophecy that an X-Men is going to destroy their planet. And so they actually create a cure for the X-Gene for being a mutant. And they come to Earth and they start to distribute it. And it's all really, really crazy. Now, this sort of leads into a situation where they defeat that villain but only for a time basically like kicking them back to their planet and they kind of sideboard that and then there's this situation where the danger room itself becomes sentient and it's be pretty much professor x's fault and this being becomes sentient uh danger really cool in comics uh, really cool design and gives the x-men a run for their money it's really ridiculous then there's this whole part where the X-Men pretty much turn on Professor Xavier and they're like, nah, this dude's not it. He's not that cool. He kind of did a lot of shady stuff, so we don't want to mess with him anymore. It's revealed that Emma Frost has been working for the twin sister of Charles Xavier this entire time, and she's trying to have her body resurrected. She's a crazy, powerful, sonic, uh, telepathic being, much like Professor X. She's set up in the Grant Morrison run, so they kind of follow up with that and have that going on. And this all leads to a place where it's revealed that Colossus is the X-Men that's going to destroy that planet, and they're 
going to destroy Earth because they don't want their planet to be destroyed. So they create this big bullet in a planet that's going to fire at Earth and destroy Earth. OK, so then you basically have a series of events take place where nobody can stop it. This big bullet is shot at Earth. Kitty Pride goes into the bullet. She phases the entire bullet as it is going through planet Earth, saving everybody, but then flying off into space, sacrificing herself to save everybody. OK, and there's a lot of little things that I left out of there. But generally speaking, it is a really, really cool run, very character driven. And yes, the events of it are really wild, but they sort of force in these existential questions and more personal problems for all of the different characters, right? So like the cure of the mutation, that's really wild. And all of them contemplate what it would be like to be normal, except of course for Logan, because if they took away his mutation, he would just die and collapse because of all that adamantium. But look, they explore that idea. It's interesting. The danger room sort of becomes this allegory for this person they thought was their mentor in Charles Xavier actually exploiting their weaknesses and doing things that they're not comfortable with. Danger, who knows them so well, becomes sentient and really gives them a run for their money, like absolutely whoops their butts. Emma Frost and Professor X's sister has been toying with them the entire time. She's making Beast become feral, going hulked out. She makes Logan revert to like a childlike version of himself. She gives Kitty Pride a vision in which her and Colossus end up having a son, and then she rips that away from her. Like, she's doing some really crazy stuff to try to tear them apart. And to see them then torn apart, but then reassemble, come back together, and actually fight to try to save humanity who hates them is a very X-Men ending, and Kitty, of course, sacrificed herself. It's really cool. The reason I think this is such a brilliant run for the MCU to pull from is because it kind of establishes that the X-Men have been around for some time. Like, this run does absolutely not work as an origin story. All of these things have to be set up. And in fact, a lot of the things that happen in the movies, like Jean Grey going away, like the leather suits, like cures for mutations all of these kind of different things could perhaps be played upon in the mcu version to set up somewhat of a history that people could be familiar with right the events of the mcu x-men are likely very different than what happened in the fox x-men films but casual moviegoers still remember a lot of things from the cat or from the fox x-men movies and so playing off of that sort of stuff even having like some cheeky fun with it I think would be a really good move. And I also just think it's kind of meta. Like if you think about it, the 90s X-Men movies changed comics and comics went through a really crazy period with the X-Men at a time when the X-Men comics were getting stale. And now we're going to see the X-Men movies come in and sort of follow up to the shakeup that followed up to the shakeup. I don't know. For me as a big fan, it's just kind of crazy what's happening. And I absolutely love for any and all of this stuff to be adapted into the MCU in the MCU X-Men film. So, of course, let me know what you think about any of this. Bring any questions you have about any of this stuff to me on one of our live streams. I'll go over it with you right then and there. Smizzash a like button on this video if you found it to be enjoyable. And make sure you're coming back to the channel, staying subscribed, because we're going to be pumping out a ton of fun, nerdy content as more nerdy, awesome things happen. And if you're looking to watch more, why not check out the video on the screen right now, which is talking about the 10 rings from Shang-Chi and what they might actually be in the MCU and how this will set up Secret Wars. It's really fun, really cool theory. Why not give it a click? It's right there on the screen.